And our next speaker is Professoressa Silvana Sciara. She's the first woman elected by the parliament as a judge at the Italian Constitutional Court. She started her mandate in November 2014 after serving as full professor of labor law and European social law at the University of Florence. She, she, has a, she holds a degree from Harvard University and from the University of Bari. She has published extensively in, a, in specialized journal for more than, for many years. She published especially in the journal of uh, labor law and in the industrial relations. So she's going to talk about <coughs> European governance and the challenges of global solidarity. Over to you, Professor Esa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this invitation, which is uh, a great honor for me. Uh, I have no slides. Uh, I sure won't use the PowerPoint. Uh, I'll start by touching upon principles of subsidiarity and proportionality, which are founding principles in European Union law. And they, they're founding principles because mainly they deal with the distribution of competences and consequently the recognition of powers. Beyond the law, <coughs> proportionality and subsidiarities have philosophical and sometimes even ethical implications as long as they challenge hierarchies in organizations as well as in politics. Uh, I have also a quotation as many speakers before me from the encyclical letter Laudato Si, which is illuminating in as much as they open up a space for reflection in what I'm going to offer to you as my, my thoughts. And the quotation is number is point 196. Let us keep in mind the principle of subsidiarity, which grants freedom to develop the capabilities present at every level of society, while also demanding a greater sense of responsibility for the common good from those who wield greater power. Today, it is the case that some economic sectors exercise more power than states themselves. But economics without politics cannot be justified, since this would make it impossible to favor <coughs> other ways of handling the various aspects of the present crisis." End of quote. In the current discussion on European governance, and I'm happy to see that there are so many links with my, the speaker before me, although we had never met before, uh, th th this passage of the encyclical letter, which is mainly referred to environmental issues, uh, is the right key to hold uh, if we want to enter some of the most controversial points I want to address. I will present a controversial notion of governance, which does not mean that I am uh, negatively critical of the concept itself. But uh, first I want to mention an important source in European Union law, which is the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is now binding law by all means in European, uh, in the treaty, it's attached to the treaty and it's now binding law where again uh, we find the principle of subsidiarity, which means the following point, very important for lawyers. The provisions of the Charter are addressed to the institutions, bodies, offices, and agencies of the Union. So subsidiarity really in this uh, context is a reminder <coughs> of institutional responsibility institutions in the end must be responsible for the enforcement of rights, in this case of fundamental rights. Uh, and, and as my previous speaker, if I understand correctly, I do not embrace theories on the end of state. I think states are still significant in uh, um, guaranteeing the enforcement of rights. They are uh, at state level and at international level so in international law. Now here I think that subsidiarity should be confused with pluralism. This is why uh, sometimes the notion of governance, in order to be correctly understood, needs to be contextualized, and it's what you did in your speech before. Um, mm, let us look at economic governance in the European Union 
now. It's a very technical apparatus of norms that was actually uh, <coughs> uh, maybe brought to some closer and possibly more coherent uh, context uh, during the financial and economic crisis. And this point is strictly related to an issue that I want to underline, and that's the issue of representation, especially for weaker and marginal groups, the ones that were most uh, severely, uh, that were most severely hit by the crisis. Perhaps the issue of representation, the way I present it, is very close to the notion of legitimacy that you pointed out before. And the other point I want to make is uh, the challenge or perhaps the many challenges to solidarity, uh, which again, solidarity has to be considered the founding principle of European Union law. Uh, at the beginning of the years 2000, there was a long discussion in academic circles. Some of them were philosophical and political science circles at the Catholic University of Louvain. And they were using <coughs> the notion of governance as uh, uh, a return or perhaps uh, a discovery of procedural law, opening up to civil society, expanding the number of stakeholders in uh, European uh, Union law. Uh, so in a sense, listening to voices coming from different groups, uh, it is interesting to look at this theory, which was and still is a fascinating theory after some years, because uh, mm, those attempts, uh, which were in legal theory, attempts to overcome legal positivism, uh, looking at what lawyers like to call spontaneous orders, uh, as if uh, the lack of binding norms uh, would imply better democracy and perhaps opening up to uh, enhanced social justice. I say it's interesting to look at these theories some years ago because uh, in the aftermath of the economic and financial crisis, uh, opening up of deliberative processes, that's what the beginning of the 1920, the 2000 year, 2000 uh, was the idea, um, should have been on these more open contextualized procedural rules, but there were strong risks and those risks unfortunately became true at some point of technocratic uh, uh, circles becoming the controllers of governance in, in that theory. So paradoxically, this movement towards an open system of uh, decision making ended up weakening the role of organizations such as those which are close to my uh, academic background because I am a labor lawyer. In my previous life, I was a labor lawyer. I still am. Uh, mm, weakening the role of organizations such as uh, unions representing labor and organizations representing business, which are actually mentioned in the Treaty of the European Union. There is an article 152 in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union mentioning the unions and the management organizations and mentioning the notion, which is a fascinating notion, of social dialogue which means they come together and they're actually consulted by the Commission in the process of lawmaking. What, why am I mentioning this evolution of, somebody may think this is a, an involution from the original theory of governance. Well, first of all, because uh, I think the notion of solidarity has been traditionally shaped around collective <coughs> interests. This is true for most Western European uh, countries where labor unions have been very strong in portraying collective interests and also in translating representation into standards and making those standards binding for members and for non-members of the unions. Uh, so they prepare the ground for standard setting procedures which are meant to protect weaker parties. I am convinced that this practice is still relevant although throughout the world there is widespread criticism against labor unions. They're not representative anymore. They don't remember to represent the very weak and the very marginal in the labor markets. And they're more protecting those who are already in employment 
and maybe are granted some fair wages. But I still am convinced that solidarity should be, uh, or perhaps one way of enhancing solidarity should be by empowering representative groups and making them responsible for the enforcement of standards. But of course, criteria of representation must be very clear. Here again, legitimacy must be very clear. And I think that these criteria must be dictated by states and in some cases by supranational institutions, like for example, the European Union institutions. Uh, what happens instead, some, some traditional notions of solidarities have been slowly sidelined in the European discussion. Mm, maybe when economic and financial uh, um, measures having, and the crisis in particular, we had to counterbalance the uh, dominant impact of the financial crisis and we sort of forgot these important representative groups. <coughs> For example, what is going on in Europe now? We have what is called EU economic governance. It's called the European semester. It's a very complicated uh, series of um, procedures. It's semester because it's done in a semester of the year and it's governed mainly by the Commission. Uh, and there is no place for consultation of representative organizations in the European semester, although now there is some attempt to open up to civil society during this uh, technocratic procedure. And uh, mm, what, what they need to do during the European semester is basically to tackle the soundness of economic uh, stability at, European, at the state level. Um, Perhaps there is a reaction to, 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 to this sort of very um, elitarian uh, European semester uh, procedure in order to open up and listen to the voice of representative groups and perhaps uh, a slight reaction which is sort of encouraging labor lawyers like me, but not only labor lawyers but also um, people who are attentive to social justice is that a few years ago, a few weeks ago, a meeting in Gothenburg of the ministers of uh, the European Union uh, decided to adopt the so-called pillar of social rights. And I like the symbolism of a pillar, which gives the idea of a construction rather than a destruction of uh, Europe because I am in favor of continuing to construct in the European Union. So there is a reaction to austerity measures through the adoption of this European pillar of social rights. Uh, during the crisis, in providing assistance to countries which were severely hit by the crisis, one, I'm sure all of us have in mind images we have seen from Greece, which doesn't mean that other countries were not in a better position, but Greece in particular, we had this image of a country which was constrained under strong austerity measures. In order to receive financial support, countries undergoing a severe crisis had to sign what is called a memorandum of understanding, one of the one of the institutions on the other side was the IMF, together with the European Commission, the European Central Bank. And these memorandum of understanding were imposing severe cuts on spending for social protection, for pensions, for salaries, for health. Uh, this meant insisting on groups which were already very weak, very destabilized uh, social context, imposing sacrifices on parts of the population which were poor and deprived of essential needs. And unions and other groups, non-state actors, were very active in <coughs> promoting legal actions in all possible fora. And one international organization, the ILO, which sits in Geneva and is a tripartite organization and is in a sense the counterpart of the WTO, they don't like each other very much. Uh, the ILO was incredibly active in promoting uh, social justice in these countries, in Greece in particular. Now there is a widespread literature criticizing the way austerity measures have been enforced in Europe. And there, there's been an attack on solidarity 
Um, and there is a call now for inventing new legal ways of uh, measuring ex ante the economic and social context and not imposing sacrifices. We hope there won't be need again of austerity measures, who knows, but not imposing sacrifices again on the weakest. The implication of this methodology should be that some minimum <coughs> standards uh, this is the European Parliament also has produced research on this. Minimum standards of welfare and social protection should be guaranteed, should be untouchable, uh, whatever austerity measures should be decided. And the principle underlying all this uh, stream of thinking is respect for dignity. I'm, I'm happy to have heard the word this morning during the some of the discussion that I followed from this morning panel. Uh, dignity is, after all, an individual right. Again, it's present in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. It's an individual right which permeates the principle of equality. And I have mentioned so far challenges to solidarity, which are challenges to fundamental principles of EU law, because we have, as I said, dignity and equality in the in the European Union law. For example, there is a constant challenge to the principle of equal treatment whenever some groups of the population have been treated differently from others. For example, younger versus older workers, men versus women, pensioners versus poor. How can these distortions uh, the principles of equality be corrected and should be in, who should be in charge of correcting these uh, disequilibria. Courts, and in particular constitutional courts, and I'm talking of my new job, uh, they have been central in the wake of the crisis. Many European constitutional courts have been addressed with challenges to austerity measures. Um, and these are challenges to, con to solidarity, because solidarity has strong constitutional implications in many, many fields of constitutional law, solidarity is a principle. And, and courts may, at this point, be tempted or may be pushed to acquire a, an activist role in setting the borders <coughs> of solidarity, taking into account financial constraints, but nevertheless setting the borders of solidarity. Uh, are courts representatives? And, and should they occupy the scene of legislators? My, my uh, answer is no. I strongly believe they should not occupy the space of legislators. They should be the guardians of solidarity. They should constantly monitor the, that fundamental rights are respected and do not become subordinate to market rules. They should consider challenges to solidarity whenever they imply challenges to fundamental rights. They should alert the lawmakers when challenges are transformed into infringements of law, and this happens very often. So judicial activism, which could be uh, for some people a solution, or happens to be a solution, is not the best way, I think, to enhance solidarity, although I do acknowledge the importance of constitutional courts in assessing the balance of powers and the balance of rights. But networks of solidarity should emerge through democratic processes, should be the product of real and concrete interests in society. So again, I say subsidiarity is not equal to pluralism, Although pluralism <coughs> for lawyers has so many interesting meanings because pluralism is pluralism of sources, and we do need pluralism of sources. You were referring to the multi-level global governance. I mean, we adopt that language as well as lawyers. Um, pluralism of actors and of lawmakers. There are many lawmakers beyond parliament. And uh, um, evocative again in Laudato Si is this notion of open systems, open systems which are also open systems of norms in connection to, to each other. Um, so I have so far described two systems of representation which should be vehicles of solidarity in my view. One system is groups which are rooted in society, they're holders of collective interests, 
they are responsible for the enforcement of standards, uh, representative groups which should prevent inequalities and enhance fairness and justice. The second set is national parliaments which should translate solidarity into binding norms, guarantee the rule of law, as you mentioned, uh, establish priorities, select the measures uh, and provide support. But national parliaments in Europe are also responsible for the enforcement of European law. And here comes the critical point because we would like the European institutions to be as active as national parliaments should be in enhancing solidarity. This is a slight critique which does not imply an overall negative evaluation of what Europe is doing, but it's just uh, for somebody like me who has been uh, working in European social law for many years, th there is a slight frustration in not seeing enough of that law being now promoted through European institutions abroad to the stage of legislation. Because there are vulnerable groups and people at risk of, po of poverty which do not perceive, and I think quite rightly so, the vicinity of European Union institutions. Here, the principle of uh, subsidiarity, which I mentioned in my opening remarks, comes back, because European institutions should be uh, following the principle of subsidiarity, equally responsible as states are in uh, mm, the enforcement of the law. Although at the periphery of <coughs> supranational systems, like the legal uh, system of the European Union, we find some answers to all these challenges because we do find active groups at the periphery of legal systems providing solidarity measures. But I'll just make the example, and then I'll, uh, I'm very close to the ending of my presentation, the example of wage policies, because I do think that this is crucial in the current discussion. Wage policies, workers who are temporarily uh, crossing frontiers to work, uh, there is an expression in European law which is uh, not very nice but gives the idea, they are called posted workers. They are workers who move to a neighboring country for a, term, for a definite time of time to work. Well, they're still paid lower salaries in many cases. And only a few weeks ago, the President of the European Commission has pointed out, it's a very late uh, speech, but nevertheless it came about, has pointed out to the inconsistency of what should be a principle of solidarity across the EU. A and uh, Juncker said, in a union of equals, there can be no second-class workers and referred to equality in wages. So here we are discussing equality in wages, which apparently is not yet a guaranteed principle in law in Europe. There is a hope now that this promise will be maintained. I, I, I hope so. But let us consider again the pillar of social rights, which I mentioned before. <coughs> Luckily, there is uh, uh, one of the principles of the pillar. The, pr the pillar is constructed around several principles. One of these principles, principle number six, is in fact on fair wages. And uh, I'm very proud to hear the language of the Italian constitution, which is very similar to the point, principle number six. Adequate minimum wages shall be ensured in a way that provide for the satisfaction of the needs of the worker and his, her family in the light of national economic and social condition and so on. So, the right to fair wages, which is now in the pillar, and here again, the individual who has a right to fair wages is considered in a context because his or her right to dignity, fair wages equal dignity of the worker, uh, substantiates into fair wages, fair wages which are actually decided better at a collective level. So we have a standard of wages which is decided collectively. And the pillar of social rights also mentions minimum income. This is a very controversial issue. I won't, I won't say anything except that the principle of minimum income uh, opens up by saying everyone has a right to minimum income. Now, what does the word everyone mean? And what, 
will it mean in the last major challenge that I must mention before finishing my presentation, a challenge that I'm not even able to present to you for the uh, complexity, um, and as the challenge to solidarity, which is connected to the flow of desperate migrants coming to Europe and uh, seeing Europe as uh, a land of hope, and are we able, capable to imagine a, a potential a context in which uh, their aspirations will be um, met? Um, I think there is an insurmountable gap now between solidarity within the EU and sometimes uh, only the member states of the economic and monetary unions are within certain uh, measures on solidarity, not all of them. And solidarity, and, and the EU, sorry, which has become, as I said, the place where migrants arrive. And back to the encyclical letter I mentioned uh, before, economics without politics makes no sense. Uh, so governance techniques in the European Union have contributed, and this is my negative criticism, which has, again does not cancel or erase the positive evaluation of European developments I still maintain, but governance techniques at some point have meant some sort of depoliticization, depoliticizing, what is the word? That one, uh, which meant deliberative processes have been taken away from politics. And the idea was to open up society, to give it to stakeholders and uh, non-state actors. But is this enough to provide solidarity measures and to meet the challenges. Uh, this is why lawyers <coughs> like me should very, and that's what I've done this morning and I shall continue to do, keeping in touch with you, should listen very carefully to research which is done uh, in this uh, high level, um, very inspired place uh, and therefore expand my mind and, and, and learn a lot from you. Thank you so much for inviting me.